Greetings, saints, and everyone who has tuned in today. And let me thank you for your prayers for the last, what, two and a half months or so. Uh, as I had been going through the situation with the outcome of the concussion that happened in December, doctors have done what they had to do. The therapy has gone well. I'm back and almost 100% recovered. So today what I want us to, to look at is in this time of crisis, in this time of uncertainty, and there's too many questions that every one of us is asking. What should we as a church be emphasizing? Everyone will have to emphasize what is their role. The government has to emphasize what the government has to emphasize. And we appeal to everyone to actually support the government. The government is within its right in order to protect the citizens. But what are we as a church emphasizing? What is the body of Christ emphasizing? I want to say to us, what we overemphasize in a time of crisis, at any time for that matter, will preoccupy us. And what we emphasize will either feed on us, if it is an, an, a negative thing, it will feed on our emotional energy, it will feed on our mental energy, it will deplete us eventually. But if we emphasize the right things, despite the storm that's raging, we will be replenished in the face of a trial because what we actually emphasize feeds on us emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, and so on and so forth. I want to read a verse in, in Proverbs 25, 28 that speaks of how in any given crisis the state of a person can be. It says... Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls, which means that person may have allowed to be ramaged by the onslaught from outside. And soon as the walls are broken down, then that person is just an, a, 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 a traffic in and out. So essentially, a person who does not have a stable inner world is eventually... A victim of circumstances. So then the question of crisis is inevitable. There will always be crisis. One or the other, whether it's natural disasters, whether it's businesses falling, whether it's pestilence, whether it's sicknesses, there will always be these things. The question is, in what state do they find us? There is nothing that does not have a solution, but uh, only those who look for a solution will actually find the solution. The solution, as a matter of fact, usually starts within us as individuals, based on our inner state. And our inner state is determined by the things we emphasize when confronted with that crisis. So here are a few things that I want to suggest that as a body of Christ, we need to be emphasizing that we will, as we emphasize these things, then we can have desired change, a desired outcome. Number one, as a church, we have to emphasize the supreme truths of God. And those are the fact that in any given situation where positive change is necessary, Jesus is the final voice of change from the Father. Ours is to only speak what God the Father says through Jesus. When you read in Hebrews 1 to 2, it says, God the Father, who at sundry times and in different manners spoke in time past to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. The Bible says, 
God in the last days, in perilous times when there's all these things, has made Jesus his voice of hope. And when you, when, when you, you go to the book of Matthew 17, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says when Jesus was transfigured before them, Peter began to say, okay, let's make shelters for you, Moses, and Elijah. And, 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 and verse 5 to 6 of it says this word. It says, while he was still speaking, a, broad, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this, referring to Jesus, is my son. This is the father declaring whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Then it says, listen to him. Another version, the King James says, hear him. A greater emphasis that I like is from a version, the, the new messianic version. It says, you shall or you must listen to him. The Bible says, when the disciples hear this, they fell to the ground. So as a church, at this point, we need to be emphasizing Jesus once again. We don't emphasize Jesus in comparison to anything or any situation. We emphasize Jesus because he's supreme above any situation or any other thing. In any case, Jesus is the only one who mandated us to speak about him. We emphasize Jesus as the em of love and hope and solution and salvation. I imagine the, the, we, 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 we in a situation like Jonah and those who were traveling with him in a ship to Tarshish who found themselves. The Bible says there was a pronouncement in a time of the storm that let every man call their God. And it is time that the church actually realizes that there is no other name to be called except the name of Jesus. For Jesus is the voice. Jesus is the only one whom we call and we are saved. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are saved. Number next, number two, we need to emphasize that the Holy Spirit is the source of the change that is needed. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, speaking of the last days from Joel, Peter quotes, Joel chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 also, Peter quotes, he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit. In the last days, what is God's solution? He speaks through his son. What does he give us as a source of, of, of the change, the, 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 the impetus that we need, the momentum towards solution? He says, I will give you my spirit. My, oh, what will the Holy Spirit do? He'll show you what is to come. He will encourage you. He will comfort you. When you read in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, five, it says, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior to men, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit the solution? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates us. We are born of the incorruptible word of God. We are born of the Holy Spirit. And the sanctification that comes, that allows us to be anchored, to be like Mount Zion, unshakable, despite the fact that everything is shaking all around us. The Bible says, we, the righteous are like Mount Zion. We can live with distractions without being distracted. We can live with hopelessness without being hopeless. We can go into situations. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, speaking to Nicodemus, says, Jesus answered him, John chapter 3, verse 5 to 7. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Then he explains to him the dynamic of being led by the spirit. He says, you, you, you can feel, you can what, you can, but you see, you can't touch. You. So the person who's led in a time of a crisis, does not just flow 
where everybody seems to be thinking they should be going, they go where the Holy Spirit leads. And sometimes he may not lead us where we inherently feel we should go. Next, we should emphasize the gospel of the kingdom is the agent of change in our time. The true Christ-centered gospel of the kingdom is not just the power of God unto salvation. It is also a herald and a prerequisite of man's final hour here on earth. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Gospel is good news. We cannot shy away from telling people that God has a plan for their lives despite what is apparent. Because that is the power of, 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 of their, their, their rescue, of their salvation. And not only that. And this gospel of the kingdom of God shall be preached as a testimony to the nations. And the end will come. So we need to be preaching at this moment. Number four. We need to emphasize that the world, the lost, the sinner is the object of God's love. The object of the intended change. We should never approach the lost in a manner that Jesus never did. Jesus approached people with compassion. We should renew our compassion for the lost. I'm just imagining what is happening now. We find ourselves, that our theology of gathering is at loggerheads with our theology of going. In Matthew 28 verse 18, when we go down with it, the, the instruction goes like this. All authority is being given to me. So in other words, Jesus is not sending us empty-handed. We are given authority to trample underfoot scorpions and, and snakes. And the promise is there that nothing shall by any means harm us. Of great significance to this context is that make disciples. Go into the world. Make disciples. So what is happening now? People are finding themselves at a place where we, de we are decrying our restriction and our inability to meet. We are actually, we have forgotten that there is a balancing fact here. We don't just gather. We go. We go so that we can gather. We gather because we have gone. We have to, to still go. So if we only decried our reluctance to go, we would not so much overemphasize and decry our inhibition to God. We will seek to do both and we will find opportunities even this time to do it. So let us find our compassion for the lost. Number next. The Lord Jesus Christ has released the priesthood of all believers. We need to emphasize that. Why? Because God's solution for the world in this life days is Christ obedient, Holy Spirit led and empowered through gospel preaching and through gospel living, compassionate church. Now, it's amazing that Christ gave the Holy Spirit to the church, not to the individuals. And, and what does 1 Corinthians 12, 7 tells us? It says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the common good. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, as each one has been given a gift, let him use it, what? To serve others as, as a faithful minister of God's manifold grace. So the point of this is that God has, has, is shaping or intends to shape a kingly priesthood, not super what? Super apostle individuals. So what we lacking and then what is being revealed as our shortcoming as a church generally is that now people are going to find themselves at home. They are theologized and practicalized to come to one man and 
underplay their priestly role and underplay their kingly role. And so now, what do priests do? They stand before God on behalf of men. They stand before men on behalf of God. They make priestly intercessory prayers for the nations. But now people are just used to be laying hands on. The, they are not taught to pray as priests. They are not taught to, to pray kingly prayers, to, to declare those things that be not. That the centurion comes to Jesus and he says, I don't deserve that you come into house, but speak. Speak the word. We, we are at a place where we need kingly prayers, where people can speak the word and know that prayer will achieve despite the distance. As a matter of fact, there are people who have been debating the whole concept of, I don't know where these conspiracy theories come from because they were not part of the president's speech. But... Here's what some people have been thinking, that no, there's a, there's a vendetta against the church. No, the, no, there's no vendetta against the church. What has been pronounced is all-inclusive. But suppose we were to be told not to meet. Our theology again will be brought into light that actually we have come to believe that the church is only the church when it gathers in great numbers. Even if it was just people gathering in the name of the church whilst they are sinners. When Jesus has said, where two or three are gathered in my name. So the church would in its truest form still meet, it would still be kingly, it would still be priestly. Even in its fewer numbers. And so the true gospel must be emphasized, the true priesthood of all believers should be emphasized. And as such, it is time that we pray what, 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 what James says, an effective prayer of a righteous man. Everyone who's righteous is in a place of casting out demons, fighting principalities. We are in a place and the world needs the church to rise to that uh, 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 challenge. Number six, the word of God must be given its place in our lives. We must remind ourselves of God's promises. The crisis in the world right now is highlighting to us the weak areas that we need to emphasize that we have not been emphasizing. God has made it clear. He watches over his way to perform it. God has given us his way. As a matter of fact, when you think it through, the fact that God says through the psalmist, he sent his word, he healed our diseases, that his word not only is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, but his word is life to our bones. His word is, 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 is healing, is medicine to us. When God's word is not given its place, God's provision for solution is denied. I wonder what we will do without God's solution. The other thing that we need to be emphasizing that we have not been emphasizing rightly over this time is the authority of the believer. Believers must know that we have been given authority. And sometimes we have been churchized and socialized and all nice to become dependent, to undermine authority that we have. But this situation, this crisis, is challenging everyone to say, stand in the authority of the name that you were given. If you are a child of God, the, the, the demonic world, the world of sickness and disease and crisis, recognizes that you can speak life. Hence, the demons could actually confront the sons of Sceva and say, you, you say in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. Listen here. Jesus we know, Paul we know. You, who are you? In whose name do you come? What authority you have upon us? So we need to re-emphasize that 
everyone should exercise their gift. Everyone has been given a, a gift. Everyone is anointed differently, yes. But let's exercise the authority that God has given us. And let's also emphasize covenant with God. We are in a covenant. In a covenant, the, the strength of one partner is used to, to overshadow, to cover and complement the weakness of the earth. And, and, and as human beings, in all aspects, we are weak. We are weak when we pray. We don't know what we ought to pray for. We are weak in every other area. But here's the good thing. We are in a covenant with an almighty, supreme, all-reigning God, who is a covenant-keeping God, who says if anyone touches us, they touch the apple of his eye. God gave Saul a clap. And Saul said, Lord, he said, he says, Saul, why are you persecuting? Saul had not gone to heaven to touch God. He had touched the church. And so the point of it is we are in covenant. And in covenant, God is obliged by the covenantal terms of his word to see us through if we put our faith in him. So let's put our faith back in God. Let's answer in the affirmative when Jesus says, when I come, will I find faith. So I, I just want to say to us, you know, many of us, like the church of Sardis in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, have things we need to sort out to strengthen and have, to, have things we need to work on so that we are rightly positioned where God wants us to be. This is what God said to the church. Jesus says to the church in Sardis. He says, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So let us, let us actually work on not just being confessors of, of, of this faith and professors, but actually people who live actively what we believe. He says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds, your works unfinished, incomplete in the sight of my God. So although they were doing something that they felt was enough for their context, Jesus says, no, it's incomplete. I don't know what made it incomplete. One of the things that the Bible speaks of the people there in the old Israel, it says, when the word came to them, the word of God's salvation and rest and provision and deliverance and every need that they had, they never mixed it with faith. Maybe. But the point of it is that he says, remember therefore what you have received the engrafted way that is able to save your soul. Do not just be a hearer. Be, he says, what you have heard, hold fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come. So I want to emphasize to us that let's emphasize love for neighbors. Let's emphasize faith. Let's emphasize the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living despite what is apparent. Let's emphasize that Jesus truly is the only need that we have that will need meet all the other needs. And whilst we are at it, let us be aware that we won't all react to this crisis is the same. But there are things we can do practically whilst we are at home. So a few things we want to suggest spiritually. Practice your devotional disciplines personally and with your family. Fast, pray, um, have holy communion, share the word of God, testify, you know, speak to other people. Do what you need to keep yourself emotionally or rather spiritually uplifted. Wake up early in the morning. Do not oversleep. Do not overeat. Do not watch too much TV. These things are going to bring an overemphasis in your life that will not produce your, your envisaged results. 
you will find yourself hoping. You will, let me put it this way. You will window shop what is already provided for you in the word of God. So, physically, exercise, rest, enough. Obviously, as I said, don't oversleep. Listen to things that make you laugh. Laughter is good for you this time. And, and, and read books that are uplifting. And most importantly, the Bible says, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Let these things remain in your heart. Can I just pray for us? Won't you just join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone who has tuned in. I pray that God, despite what is apparent out there, despite the uncertainties, we stand convinced that all things are possible to them that believe because nothing is impossible with you, Lord. So as servants look unto their master, we look unto you, Jesus, author and the finisher of our faith. You, our high priest and the apostle of our faith. We put our trust in you. We do not trust in finances. We do not trust in politicians. We do not, we do not trust in anyone. For cursed is anyone who puts his trust in another man and makes the flesh, the arm of the flesh, his strength. Such a man will not see prosperity when it comes. But blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. So, Father, we put our trust in you. And we pray that over this crisis, as many as don't know you will come to know you. They will come to know your sufficiency. I pray for marriages, strengthen marriages, strengthen relationships. Give people divine ideas about their businesses. Heal the sick, Father, through your word. And, 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 Father, I ask that may you restore the fortunes of our country. May you restore the fortunes of the church and every other person that is listening to this broadcast, Lord. May we all see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.